Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 313 of the Drunk Dashers Podcast. I'm your host, as always, I'm Tyler, and joining me, we have the man, the myth, the legend himself, Sir Colonel Gables. What's up, buddy? Hey, Tyler. Ha, long time no talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Well, I'll tell you what, though. This week has been one hell of a ride, and by one hell of a ride, it's, I mean specifically for me going through and shoveling everything else, because there was so much snow. Apparently, Tyler, in his infinite knowledge a couple weeks back, kind of predicted, oh, hey, hey, let's go ahead, man. You're going to go through a bunch of snow just like I did. And wouldn't you know it, a week later, all this massive foot of, like, snow, honestly, around the Collin County area, it was, like, around maybe close to two feet of snow, which almost completely, actually did for a time, immobilized the town of Squim, Washington, for, like, at least a good couple days. <laughs> but the positive thing about that is I ended up getting a week off of work. I had enough vacation time to cover it. And uh, I spent a lot of my times either watching stuff, playing stuff, or most of the time I had to go out and work and just shovel. <laughs> so, other than that, though, it's just been one crazy week. But, anyway, how have you been, Tyler? Um exhausted yeah uh yeah no so uh it's been yeah yeah so i, I made the prediction that it was all going to go towards you it hits you last week and then it came right back to us <laughs> um has been belting us since yeah pretty much it dumped everything on you last week and, and came right back we've had multiple snowstorms the last like two weeks we got looks like a couple more this week um i i know with weather talking bitching about weather is like the most boring thing to do on a podcast but I am so done with winter. Yeah. I was talking to J- Justin yesterday. Yeah, he's like, dude, he's like, I can't wait for it gets nice out. We can play frisbee golf. I'm like, I agree. I like, I would like to have some fresh air that doesn't hurt my face every time I walk out into it. <laughs> um, so no, instead of yeah, having the been, cold air that hits your face, it's going to be a frisbee that hits your face when you're playing frisbee golf. <laughs> you know what? At this point, that sounds better. I'm all in for that. Um, yeah, I, I'm done. I'm done with winter. <laughs> I, I I just want to be able to walk to my car with it. I don't. I like. I like to leave the house for once in the morning or to go to work or something like that, or right. just go anywhere and not have to like destroy my tires to get out or scrape off my car or let it heat up for 25 minutes or shovel my way out of something or drive 10 miles an hour to work. I have to get up to work even earlier uh, to work longer hours and drive 10 hours or 10 take. 40 minutes to get to work i'm just done i'm done i'm over it it's my that's my weather rant um for today uh same time next week guys um <laughs> yeah so no it's pretty much been kind of another crazy week you know normal week for me just a lot of working a lot of hours a lot of working uh it's been busy um but i do want to apologize for last week um only the second time ever in nearly six years that we, we missed a week um but it's funny in both of those weeks that we missed, we recorded a podcast. It just didn't get, it didn't get uh, uh, the, something happened to the audio. So I'm not sure what happened. Um, everything was fine on th- this one was my fault. Uh, I just don't know what I did. Uh, everything was fine uh, when when I went to bed. We recorded Saturday night. I went to bed. Uh, I I exported, had everything ready to go, so I can just I was gonna edit first thing in the morning on Sunday, and. Uh, my audio was there when I went to bed, woke up, didn't close anything, didn't do anything, left it open all night, came over and it was gone. Like I, I pressed play and it was just, and it was blank. Um, I honestly don't know what happened. So I do apologize for that. Um, and I just didn't have the time to, uh, we didn't really have time to sit down and re-record. And um, honestly, there wasn't really a lot to happen last week. Um Couple, like we had the Xbox Live on Switch thing, which but that was super vague. We had no idea what was going with that. Right. Apex Legends came out, um, and I think there was like one other thing. So it wasn't it wasn't a lot going on. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, it sucks. I you know I, I I I always talk about the thing about I'm most proud of about this show was only ever missing one week in almost six years, and you know the streak is over. First week we've missed in uh, about five years. So <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyways, this is uh, episode 313 uh, again, the second time. Uh, so, but hey, this ain't the first time. I remember, we, I remember there was like one podcast. I think it was like episode 49. We had to record it like three times. Yeah, we did. We kept losing audio. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, um, it, well, there was one where we, we were saying we couldn't talk about Peter Dinklage because every time we mentioned Peter Dinklage, That's we right. lost our audio. Yeah, remember that now. Um, but anyways, uh, 
actually had a decent amount of news this week. Uh, what's their mm, decent what's is their, an understatement. Not, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. So not a crazy amount of like stories, but pretty big stories. Uh, I think we'll start with the first one, the big, the biggest one. I think uh, for you know that makes people excited uh, is we didn't finally had an, 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 I can't talk Nintendo Direct this year. Um, everybody, well, we had, a, had an itch there, um, but uh, we've been talking. Everybody was like, "Oh, where's the direct? It's coming in January." And every week you hear rumors about there's going to be a direct this week. There's going to be a direct. Ah, there's talking about being a direct on Thursday or Tuesday, and we, you know, you, most time, more times than not, it's usually accurate. But this time it was like it was just like every week, so you just stop believing it and until finally they announce, "Hey, we're having a direct on Thursday." Um, this one was about 30, I think it was like 35, 36 minutes. Uh, and it dealt with everything. There was no 3DS talk whatsoever. I think it's the first direct we've had in a long time or maybe ever that didn't deal with 3DS. True. Since the Switch has come out. And, um, so yeah, so this one, it dealt with everything Switch and games coming out in 2019, uh, which was really cool. I thought, so it started off big with, um, Super Mario Maker 2, uh, being revealed and also with some gameplay, and it's going to be out this June. Um, so I think I, we can probably talk about these piece by piece. Uh, so what was your reaction when, when you saw this? Honestly, the Nintendo Direct, the reaction that I had initially was just kind of blown back by not only they didn't talk about any type of 3DS stuff whatsoever, which is making a lot of sense and considering that the 3DS is winding down as a system, but another is just how consistent of... Good quality information was coming out in terms of which games were going to be available to, you know, like at specific points, either in the spring or the summer or some. A lot of them were confirmations for stuff releasing this year, which was very much a surprise to me as well. But another thing that I was very surprised of is just the big kind of reveals and stuff like the very end with The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening being remastered and and pretty much brought to the Switch. That was a huge deal to me. I absolutely loved it because it has been... What is it? The original Link's Awakening came out in the early 90s, around 93, I want to believe, on the original Game Boy. And uh, just watching just the initial reveal trailer, I was thinking to myself, okay, this has got to be big right here. This is after the revealing of another new game that's coming to Switch this August. That uh, it... <laughs> And uh, I was watching the trailer initially, just thinking to myself, oh, hey, hell, this is pretty interesting. This is kind of weird. And all of a sudden, I see a shadow in the middle of things. Like, it just hits me right then, and there's like, this is Link's Awakening, isn't it? And all of a <laughs> sudden, it's like, I I get the strange like uh, flashbacks to that scene, because it's like, that initial cutscene that they showed in the Nintendo Direct was a remaster of what was originally on the DX version of Link's Awakening for the Game Boy Color that uh, updated sort of thing for the Game Boy Color. And initially that cutscene was placed there and like Link is basically on a little makeshift boat drifting across the water and stuff. He hits a bad storm and stuff and the storm is capsizing his little ship and stuff and he washes ashore. And uh, everything else about it just made me kind of want to watch a Nintendo sanctioned like anime on like freaking Link's Awakening because <laughs> that looked absolutely awesome. I, I kid you not, that looked freaking awesome. But uh, when I saw the gameplay of it, I just felt like it was an awesome mix between the design of retaining the classic nature of Link's Awakening in general, and then uh, adapting sort of like how 3D Dot Game Heroes did, and sort of like that type of Zelda style. It seemed like there was mixed a little bit of that, but it was silky smooth because it made me kind of feel like I was watching sort of like a indie sort of game kind of fuse in between like a sort of a clap no sort of like a little hd like coat and stuff like it's not exactly kind of like the the little 8 or 16 bit sort of like style like the original game was but at the essence it's more or less kind of like its own style of game and when you compare specific like uh screenshots between what was revealed in that trailer and see what was originally in the game boy is just striking i mean i saw little bits of things that were like very familiar Especially since I've played A Link to the Past somewhat, but I've never beaten that game. That's just one of those like moments and stuff where I've seen a whole bunch of these bosses before in the beginning portions. But uh, I like that about the Nintendo Direct, because it felt like there was something for everyone, and that whole the Zelda Link's Awakening thing was more apparent to longtime fans of Nintendo and stuff. I loved how it appealed that way. 
what I also liked was just the revealing of new games we had, like, no information on. Like, uh, I think it was, like, what was it? Astral something. Astral Chain. Yeah, Astral Chain. Yeah. That's the new Platinum game that's going to be coming out this August. I liked what I saw because this is like a Hideki Kamiya game, essentially. This is like a Platinum style of game where it's just majorly over the top action oriented and stuff there is like all these crazy characters here and that it just had the marking of it and i, I was just left thinking like what the hell is this game it's like it, it kind of felt familiar but at the same time it kind of felt like it was one of those type of games where it's like okay this has got to be either from nanda namco bandai or platinum and wouldn't you know it's from platinum I'm like okay okay i'm all in this looks pretty cool but uh, there's a bunch of new games that reveal, but it was like... Other than that, though, there were some downs in the Nintendo Direct, I thought. Like, the whole like, explanation things for Fire Emblem Three Houses. It was just a whole bunch of basic information that people who have already played Fire Emblem and stuff kind of know by now. I mean, I like that they have your own choose-your-own-faction and you can join and do this and do that. But there wasn't really anything new in terms of, like, Fire Emblem gameplay that I saw that was kind of appealing. It more or less was kind of unveiling a little bit of the story and then just revealing the whole date being kind of pushed back instead of like this late spring like they had promised initially. It was more like, oh, okay, this is releasing by the end of July. You know, July 26th or 27th or something like that. 26th. Yeah, the 26th. Thank you. And uh, it is kind of a hit in the gut because I kind of was looking forward to seeing how Fire Emblem was going to be doing towards the end of the spring. But hey, a little bit of a wait on that game is fine. If they got to iron out some bits of more like quality concerns i fully understand that but uh overall i was left just very surprised very intuitive like in terms of uh what i am to be expecting over the next six months pretty much six to eight months and quite honestly i was just kind of impressed yeah so Tyler, um, what were you thinking man oh um I, yeah, I really like this one. This is one of the better directs I think they've had. Agreed. Um, in a long time. Not, not saying that they've had some bad ones lately, but I think from mostly beginning to end, it was pretty good. There was definitely, yeah, there's some downsides to, the, to it, but I thought jumping off right away with Mario Maker 2 uh, oh, yeah. was awesome. Oh, yeah. Really set, really set the stage. I'm like, okay, so they're starting with something big. Oh, something big is going to be in the show. Um, and, I mean, I got into Mario Maker late. Um, I, I remember I rented it or something from, like, uh, Redbox. Yeah, and I played did. it for a few days. And I liked it, and I actually went out and bought it like, a few months later. And I'm not like you know, I'm never. I've, I've talked about it a lot already with Mario Maker. I'm not really into the the creative stuff. I I did I dabble in a little bit. I did some levels, <laughs> but they were like nothing nothing to be like super proud of. Oh god! But uh, I had a blast checking out all these different levels and and playing everybody else's stuff. Um, the uh, yeah, that just I looks great. And coming out this June is awesome. Already yeah. having a kind of a release release date release window is awesome. Um, and seeing if you have the 3D World um, items in there, too, you can use. You, you got the cat suit, which is awesome. I love, I love that touch. Suit. They had to add something yeah. new to it. And they added... Yeah. And I saw the trailer over and over again, and it just tried to reconfirm. Yes, they actually have assets from Super Mario 3D World inside of this uh, Mario Maker 2. I love it. I love the aspects that you can actually create certain things like hills and certain other types of things to where you can actually scale things. And it seems like it's a lot easier in terms of use. I mean... Granted, the original Mario Maker, I loved playing a lot of on the Wii U, and it was so awesome to just go through and take the tablet of the Wii U and then just go through. That's one of the very few games where that was specifically made for the Wii U, and it worked in terms of creating levels, in terms of playing what other people have made. But I am so excited for that Switch, like, uh, version of, uh, not Switch version, but, like, I'm just ready for Mario Maker 2 because I want to delve back. I want to create my own levels again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was kind of funny though, because it was I was still at work when it when it was going on. Yeah. And somebody at work was like was was talking about it, and the, I was I was getting ready to leave while it was uh, going on, and we were starting to talk about it in the locker room, and he's like he's like yeah, I'm like I'm like dude, don't spoil anything for me, because he was keeping up keeping up with it on Twitter, and he's like, oh, like just a little little like a little thing here, a little teaser. Um, I'm really they're really excited for this this one game they they started off with. And he's like, I didn't, I didn't have a 3DS, I didn't have a, a Wii U, so I didn't get to play it. I'm like, oh, so, oh, it's, so it's Mario Maker. He's like, yeah, they're, they're putting the port <laughs> over there. So he, he, he told me, but he lied to me about, he said it was the port. And I was like, oh, that's dumb. Why would they do that? And no, it's, it's actually, it was kind of cool. I'm the next day, I'm like, you son of a bitch. Like, <laughs> you, thank you for not completely spoiling it for me, but touche. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I thought I'm I'm excited for that. I'm ready to jump into it. Check out some levels. Um, well, technically, he didn't the, spoil uh, it for you. <laughs> no, but he, he, he I, he, yeah, in a, he, in a way he did, but he didn't. Um, we got the Marvel Ultimate Alliance three. We got some uh, uh, some gameplay on that. It looks looks like it could be fun. Um, you think it's gonna be actually it, a decent game though, from what we've seen so far? Nah. Eh. I think I, I think it's gonna be like a, a seven or eight out of ten type of game when it comes out, like a Metacritic. I think it's. I gonna, think I think it possibly could be like a fun excursion stuff if you have like some of the play locally for co-op or whatever. But uh, yeah, I'm just kind of holding back, kind of hopes in this game. I like the aspect that Marvel Marvel Ultimate Alliance three is coming on the Switch, but uh, I'm very unsure how this game's gonna be once it does release. Yeah, I, I'm more excited because it's Ultimate Alliance three than I am about like looking at the game. Right. Uh, it's one of those case, one of those things where like just the the title is selling me more than the gameplay is. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm gonna. I don't know. I'm just gonna kind of wait and see. What, I don't think I'm gonna pick this up at launch. I'm gonna kind of wait and see what people say because I feel like just looking at well, the first time when they revealed it, I'm like, oh, it's like a phone. It's a Marvel phone game. Right. Like I still think it kind of looks like that. Um, maybe like a better looking Marvel phone game. Um, so yeah, but that's coming out sometime this summer. That was, so we got a release window for that. Uh, there's a big update coming for Mario Brothers or Smash Brothers Ultimate, but no news. We got some more reveals for some Amiibo. Uh, I actually went ahead and can had a bunch of Amiibo that came out on Thursday, I think. And I actually canceled the pre-orders for them. That's a good idea. Uh, I, I literally, I have like five Amiibos just sitting on my computer, like on top of my, uh, behind my monitors. Um, <laughs> just, they're still in the box. Like I have like five, I have five of them. And I'm like, why do I keep buying these things? And like, I don't even care about half these characters. So I just want to, there's a couple that I will buy, like the Pokemon ones when they come out, I'll, I'll get those. Right. Um, but the rest of them, I just don't care about. Um, one thing that I thought was really cool is that Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, um, they announced free DLC for it that came out. I think it was. Uh, it's already out. It came out um, as of then, as as the event was happening. Uh, it's with now it has two player co op. Yeah. And then also we're gonna they're gonna have a uh, paid DLC coming out for it. I believe they said March or April. Um, so I'm I'm really excited. I, I think I might I'm gonna have to play. It. I'm gonna, I still own my copy, uh, but I never actually finished it once it came out. Uh, so I think that's I'll tell you some, what. New, some new maps. I'm probably going to jump back into it. I'll tell you what, Tyler. As soon as that information was revealed about Captain Toad's like Treasure Tracker and stuff, I mean, I loved playing through the game originally on the Wii U. But it's even now more so likely that I'm going to be repurchasing this game on the Switch because not only is it an added co-op mode, but also it's adding in like a, season, like a little season pass or something like that, which there's one part of it that you can actually play now, but uh, there are yeah. future things that are going to be coming to it, and it's honestly a great buy now in terms of like forty dollars in terms of that price point and stuff i mean granted before it's a great game as is and stuff a lot of good puzzles a lot of good things and stuff but it's now more enticing to me because it's like okay now i'm playing more than just original content from the game i actually have new stuff i can go into play through whenever i feel like and stuff and it definitely felt more enticing as a purchase honestly <laughs> yeah so, uh, yeah, I'm, it, it's, it's kind of giving me the motivation to jump back into it. So, um, a couple of downside things is like, I did not care about the Dragon uh, Quest stuff. Like, they talked about Dragon Quest Eleven for a very long time. It's a game that's been out for a year. Yeah. It's funny because that was the first game, that was the first game ever announced for the Switch. And, um, I don't know. I just, they just went on, went on for way too long. Okay, cool. I, I get you have your own, like it's it's like the definitive the version has its own exclusive stuff, but it's oh just, yeah, I just think, maybe because it, I I don't care about that kind of thing. I just didn't care about it. Um, I, right, I, and just dragged. Uh, same thing I think with like, like you touched on with the Fire Emblem Three Houses. Uh, I yeah, not a Fire Emblem guy, but um yeah, I did not. I, I was just like this is dragging on for way too long. But I was like okay, this game must be coming out like soon if they're putting this much attention on it. Oh no, and to see that it got delayed again to um July twenty sixth. I mean, this, that was the first game to ever get delayed um, on the Switch. Like everything that, that they announced, Nintendo was announcing for games, like they would come out. Like in the window, they said it would. Right. Um, and Most... this was the first one to get. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Finish up what you were saying. Oh, I was saying, um, you know, this was the first one to get delayed. It was supposed to come out, you know, in 2018. Then it was supposed to be, you know, early 2019. Now it's, you know, mid summer. So, um, I. I I don't know. I'm not gonna say I'm, I'm not like super excited to play this game or anything. I, I might. It's one of those like like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. I might see what people are saying about it. 
and check it out from there. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, but also a little concerned that's you know it's, it's been delayed multiple times. Oh well, yeah, that's highly understandable. Sale. Like I was saying, it was. Uh... Yeah, it's very highly understand understandable and stuff like that, that uh, you would feel that way about Fire Emblem. I mean, hell, we haven't seen too much in terms of actual gameplay stuff. We've seen little bits of introductory things, little introductory things of, like, how Fire Emblem things go forth and stuff. But uh, I was going to pay mention or something like that. This was definitely the time of the Nintendo Direct where it kind of felt like there was a lull period and stuff. Because the next announcements and stuff like that, yeah, the Dragon Quest XI... For Switch, like you said before, touched upon it. It had already been released like a year prior on the other systems. But uh, even it's even though the game I've heard is pretty good in terms of quality and stuff like that, having it for like so long, like in terms of trying to persuade more people to invest inside this Dragon Quest game. Oh, it's the first mainline Dragon Quest game on the Switch, and then following it up by a Fire Emblem, like Three Houses and stuff. That long-winded stuff. It was definitely not the type of uh, Definitely not the type of thing that you would advertise for having someone be into the game. Because, honestly, after all those other prior announcements, prior, like, to this, it just felt like kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's just, that's passable. It's like, oh, okay, the Smash stuff. Oh, okay, nothing really new there. Joke coming out maybe into April. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I agree with the Fire Emblem stuff completely. But, uh, anyway, let's get going. <laughs> yeah, there was just there was there was just a lot of Japanese RPGs. Mm. Uh, there was like a huge section probably in the middle there where it was just back to back to back to back to back like Japanese RPG games. Um, that just you know, obviously wasn't that's not my my thing. So um, we got some we got there's a demo out now for Yoshi's uh, Crafted World. Yes, um, which I, I downloaded I've yet to play. Um, I don't think I will play it actually because it's just the first level and that game comes out fairly soon, maybe like five weeks. So. Uh, it's a game I know I'm going to play and more than likely enjoy. So uh, that's cool. And the, the kind of the big surprise, I think, of the, all of the, uh, not the biggest surprise, but the se- maybe the second biggest surprise is we got a Battle Royale Tetris game called Tetris 99. No one saw um, this coming. No. Uh, it's exclusive on the Switch. Um, and it's free It's free to play. Um, so, yeah, I, I, people I've heard are loving it. Um, Twitter is, like, blowing up about it. I've seen a lot about it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this that's is a, cool. This is the second straight battle royale style of game that's released this past year. Actually, this past month that are this unannounced. Week. Yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah, for the span of the, like a week or so like that, because you had Apex Legends like the week previously, then not even like a week later or something. You have Tetris ninety nine that releases, and hey, surprise, surprise, both games are apparently excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's awesome. So I've, I I want I need to check that out, but uh. Um, what else we have here? Oh, we had some more news on the Damon X Machina. There's a de- there's a new demo. Yeah, um, we can play. Um, I, I I just don't care about that game. The more I see it, the less I care. <laughs> Honestly, it, like we when I, when the first time we saw it last E3, I'm just like, okay, that's uh, all right. But I don't know. What, what are, are you are you feeling anything for this game? Honestly, it wasn't initially because of kind of how generic the game looked in of itself, but. Here's a little spoilers for the games that what we have been playing. The the last three things that Tyler just talked about, I actually had a chance to play in detail all three of them. So the Yoshi's Crafted like World demo, the whole Tetris 99 stuff, and the Damon X Machina prototype missions. Yeah, honestly, I kind of left the demo. That demo in of itself, I uh, kind of felt you know coming into the game and watching that initial trailer, it's like okay, this is this is all right. It's an action game. This and of that though. But I'll talk a little bit later about the actual gameplay how i felt about it <laughs> okay um yeah but i i, I just I, i'm not feeling that game um what else do we oh there's gonna be a grid auto sport there's a, there's a racing realistic racing game going to the switch yeah Woohoo. um what else? oh yeah astral chain so when the music when they started playing the music to this i'm like oh are they just they're are they putting near automata to the switch or something oh that would have been I heard nice. the music <laughs> i'm just like I'm like, oh man, that's cool. Like, I'm not gonna buy it, but that's cool. Um, I want more people can play that game now. And then it's like a whole new game, and there's people from like Near Automata and like Bayonetta and all, like it's a platinum game. So they they've had all these like games that I love. Like <laughs> people are making this game. Um, and they got the music from the guy that from Near Automata, um, in this game, or you know, he's doing the music for this game. So uh, I am 100 percent in on this game. Like the music alone sold me, and then I watched it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no, I'm in. Uh, I'm hoping this is the A team platinum uh, team. Uh, but I'm a little scared because they're also doing the uh, Bayonetta three. The uh, B- 
three and out of three. So who knows? Because it seems like they have one good team and five terrible ones. Uh, so, <laughs> but so this, true. yeah, uh, they they didn't mention that <laughs> Bane of the three uh, is is uh, still hard at work. It's gonna it's, it's a little ways off though. Still, um, I don't. It's I don't know, it's it's like the Metroid Prime Four thing where people yeah like, we people won't thinking that, we won't even see any inklings of those two <laughs> either probably until like twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we might see it at E three, maybe something for Bayonetta. It's possible, 3, but yeah. I don't feel like that game's gonna be coming out like in the next twelve months. I feel like that game is maybe like next summer. Or no, something man. Like you know what's gonna happen is once E three time comes on and stuff, maybe like the day before the initial E three starts, or maybe during the week, Nintendo's gonna probably release a direct, and it's all gonna be about the games that are gonna be releasing this fall. It's probably gonna be like the Luigi's Mansion three, probably freaking the new Pokemon games, and like all these other Animal Crossing, Animal Crossing, yeah, because those are gonna be the franchise things that's gonna carry out the end of the year. I mean, guaranteed because of all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, they got a pretty big year. Like last year was kind of like a it was a lot of ports, and then we had like the big ending with Smash and Pokemon. It was a low um, year that ended strongly with Smash and Pokemon. Yeah, like yeah, like we we think of it because those games came out so late in the year. In November, like the last like five weeks of the year, they all came out. Uh, those two games did. So we think we like, 2018 doesn't look as bad, but when you look at the first ten and a half months, it was a pretty like what we had Kirby, and yep. then Star a bunch Alice. of ports. Yep. St- yes. Yep. Um, so yeah. But uh, yeah, this year looks like it's gonna be amazing. So I mean, like we just mentioned, like f- there's four games yeah. that are still coming out in 2019 that we don't have release dates for. Exactly. <laughs> like, when, when are these coming? Um, this is and a huge probably, year. I think, yeah, <laughs> and there's probably things we don't even know about yet that could be coming this year. Um, and then they ended it with uh, the the, big, the biggest shock, I think. Um, as soon as I saw the water, um, I was talking to Justin about it. He said he's, he's like as soon he said, he said basically the same same. Yeah, can't talk. Damn it. He said the same thing. Um, where uh, he's like, as soon as I saw it, it's like I knew it was Link's Awakening, and I saw it, and I'm like, okay, this is all right. This looks like, like this could be Link's Awakening, maybe. Because I've talked about it a few times in the show, where the right. rumors forever have been that, that they're remaking Link's Awakening for the 3DS. Right. Um, and I was like, I remember, you know, I was like, ah, oh, that's gonna suck. I'm kind of like, I'd want to play that game, but I don't want to play it on my 3DS. Um, and then here we go, we got it. It's coming to the Switch. It's coming out this year. It's probably gonna be like the November game or something like that, um, or late October game, and. I mean, it, it looks amazing. I, I was talking to Justin. And I told him it looks like the like they, they got the art director from like the Kirby and Yoshi game to come and like make like do all the art for Link's Awakening. It fits. It's, dude. It just, <laughs> yeah, it it looks absolutely absolutely fun, adorable. Um, I I can't wait. This game it it it's gonna be great. I think it's got to be great. Uh, I can't I can't wait to play. But that, that was a great way to end it like i said at the beginning talking about this like they started with the bang with mario maker 2 and they ended it with with a bang uh with leaks and links awakening so um yeah i like i said i there was a big lull in the middle there i thought but i, I felt out of the 35 minutes i probably enjoyed 22 23 of them yeah uh and yeah it, oh boy links awakening that game looks incredible looks incredible yeah. i was stunned by that um so yeah um yeah i don't know uh anything else you want to say before we move on about it honestly i pretty much said initially what i was uh, gonna say a little bit earlier about uh, the whole Link's awakening stuff but as like you know probably not like uh what you and justin thought and stuff i initially thought it was Link's awakening as soon as i saw the ship pop up in the distance like mm-hmm. oh wait a minute yeah i know what this is it's like the water <laughs> The water at the start of the trailer kind of initially kind of is like, okay, what's this now? It's like, okay, there's water. There's this and that. All of a sudden, I see the tidal, the tidal wave and a small ship in the distance. Like, oh, no. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you see, like, I had a ball watching through this Nintendo Direct a whole bunch of different times with different reactions from people. And initially, it's like almost all of them are like the same thing where they notice the silhouette of, like, freaking Link or something like that, right? Well, the the minutes of the ship. Like, oh, my God, it's Link's Awakening. <laughs> Oh, but other than yeah. that, though, that's I, it was just awesome all the way around, man. It's like it started great, it ended great. There was tons of content that uh, appealed to a bunch of different consumers and stuff. It definitely was a forward momentum shift because going into that, we knew next to nothing that was going to be coming out the next six months, other than like the marquee cod titles that we've already known about, the Luigi's Mansions, the Pokemon stuff, the Animal Crossing stuff, and uh, honestly, I was left wanting 
more in terms of like more content and stuff but that's just how i am in general and stuff but overall yeah. it was a fantastic nintendo direct yeah uh, yeah the, the the peaks were way higher than the the, the valleys so oh, yeah. um yeah I, I can't wait there's there's a lot of games on the switch that uh i think the switch alone this year would could probably make me happy as far as just my gaming <laughs> time um oh i feel the same way man i feel the same yeah. way <laughs> um but moving on to some uh pretty pretty sad news upsetting news um so activision blizzard uh they announced they actually um had a layoff of 800 employees uh this past tuesday well not all of them been laid off yet some they 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 laid off a bunch already and then they um told told other areas that hey there's gonna be layoffs coming we'll let you know soon oh boy but um so usually i always like cut parts out of like out of, out of uh, different articles and I'll like put them in there so we can cover all the main stuff. I'm just going to read this entire article, not the entire article, but most, a good chunk of it from Polygon. Um, so on, uh, it starts with on Tuesday afternoon, Activision Blizzard told approximately 800 employees they were being laid off. The company, which is c- comprised of Call of Duty publisher Activision Publishing, uh, World of Warcraft and Overwatch developer Blizzard Entertainment, Candy Crush Maker, King Digital, Major League Gaming, and more did not did not have a bad year. In fact, it achieved record results in 2018. Uh, uh, CEO Bobby uh, Bobby Kotick said, which was really upsetting. I think that pissed a lot of people off, and oh, rightfully so. Yeah. Where he, they just announced that they laid off 800 800 people. 800 people lives have completely changed, and he comes out a couple hours later on their um, qu- quarterly call and says that. It, we we achieved record results in 2018. Um, oh. So the fact so Activision made seven and a half billion dollars in sales and had eight, 1.8 billion in profit last year. But in the eyes of management, the su- success wasn't enough to keep the entire company employed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, record results: 800 employees out of work. Those facts are more than just a recipe for cognitive dissonance. Uh, they create cerebral friction that could spark a forest fire, and it may have done just that. As layoffs have fueled the conversation around game unionization and executive pay. Um, so uh, um, on the call, it seemed the executives were lar- largely remorseless, with the exception of uh, the Blizzard president, um, Alan Brack, who expressed regrets of the layoff. Um, then, So social media uh, became a hotbed of anger as Activision Blizzard employees came out of meetings that signaled the end of their work, steady pay, health insurance, and stability. Right. Um, where players and developers saw people Activision refer to cost and headcount in relation to cutting 8% of its workforce. Even on the earnings call focused on the business long-term financial health and shareholder, shareholder investments, there is room for compassion. Executives instead spoke about hundreds of now jobless people in cold, dehumanizing terms. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. It, it it's just stunning. Uh, I couldn't believe that when I when I heard about it. Where um, th- there has been rumors for a little, for about a month or so now about there being layoffs in yeah. Activision and Blizzard, um, and then to hear it happen, and then them to come out and say, "Yeah, we had our best year ever, but it wasn't good enough." Like, yeah, we. we it's just it doesn't. It it's so tone deaf. To, to hear that that the fact we made 1.8 million dollars last year in profit and it wasn't enough we could have done better yeah you could have done better but you don't say that right before you lay off a bunch of people you just ruined 800 people's lives not even 800 but you ruined thousands of people's lives because now the families are affected the children are affected uh and it, it just it, it pissed me and i think a lot of people off to hear that um because you know here's someone bobby Kotick who uh, who has a base salary of $1.75 million, uh, and he owns $26 million in stock um, for that company. So, And to hear them say that we didn't make enough money. When you, uh, and a lot of people mentioned this, so I'm not the first person to mention this, but a lot of people talked about um, former uh, president uh, of Nintendo, Satoru Iwata, who cut his pay in half. So they had to lay pe- people off in 2014. When they weren't, lo- they were losing money, but it wasn't, they it wasn't like the company was going out of business to, so they wouldn't have to, so they wouldn't have to lay off all these talented people. He, he, he did the right thing. Maybe not the right thing, but he, he's in charge. It's, it's his, it's his job to make sure that this company does well and stays afloat. This, well, they make, they were losing money. Yes. But to, but he, he did the most admirable thing you can probably do as, as a CEO of a company where if, if someone like, if, if we work for a company that was losing money 
and things things weren't looking bleak, but they weren't they weren't great. You know, you're in bad probably the worst shape you've been in, in your entire in your, the entire history of the career or the company's career. Um, and you see the president of the company, even though he makes way more money than you ever will, to say, "Hey, I believe in you guys so much that I'm going to cut my pay in half to to keep you guys on, so you guys don't have to worry about losing your job." And this piece of shit who who just who's making two million dollars who help make 1.8 billion dollars um lays off eight percent because that wasn't good enough just drives me nuts i don't get it um i don't understand no matter what all the way around this is definitely a terrible situation for one you have a lot of employees that have worked there obviously for years on end that have gotten like a lot of their pink slips and whatever the hell just just basically out of the blue at the same time though it's also shady because it's like here you have this multi-billion dollar company in Activision Blizzard who posts these record highs in terms of game sales that they've had through properties like Call of Duty, properties like World of Warcraft, lots of microtransactions in terms of what they were going through. And initially, initially, in terms of, I can say, the corporate world, this is a common practice that companies do. It sucks. Absolutely it does suck. And honestly, I feel that there should be unionizations in place inside the gaming industry to try to prevent fallout of this type of magnitude from happening from like major companies. Because it's a common place that we've read over the past couple of like, not just past couple of years, but just past five, ten years in general, where say a gaming company closes down or something like that, like a big maybe gaming company or something closes some other like a property or some sort of like uh, development studio down and lots of different workers and stuff lose their jobs and stuff and they have nowhere readily to go right then and there. Obviously, this is the probably one of the biggest magnitude of things to happen in terms of the gaming industry for a long while. <laughs> but like I was saying before, in terms of like, say, the corporate world, this is def this is done initially to try to get the most bang for their buck on their bottom line. With the separation of uh, Bungie and stuff, with them retaining their rights to Destiny, even though they posted like a lot of profit, record profits in their quarterly earnings and stuff, as reported by that snake in the grass, Bobby Kotek, <laughs> it still leaves a bad taste bad taste in the mouths of many gamers all over because it's like, you have a bunch of talented different people that all of a sudden they were fearful for their jobs for weeks on end. This situation could have been handled a hell of a lot differently in terms of things. And it just kind of soured not only just that atmosphere there for like weeks on end, but it's like it sours in the mouths of gamers as well because, hey, you love playing your video games. You love playing like these specific properties that are probably more likely to have released by Activision Blizzard, say like Call of Duty Black Ops 4 or World of Warcraft or even like overwatch or whatever types of games and stuff that uh activision blizzard puts out and then just knowing in the back of your mind it's like wow this company that's shelling out these popular games and just making bank on all these random microtransactions and stuff to try to inflate their bottom dollar and stuff it's like they care nothing about a lot of the workers that they got going and stuff and the thing about it is i've heard this term passed around like for a while now and it kind of rings true companies they don't want to make some of the money they want to make all of the money mm -hmm. in terms of maximizing their profits year on end all the way back like uh, they want to try to do their best to try to make better earnings of where they were at this time last year pretty much and now that definitely does lead to situations like what happened this past week where <laughs> honestly this is how the gaming industry started last week pretty much with this big old announcement from like activision blizzard this big old report coming up from jason schreier saying that 800 different people were fired were let go of activision blizzard and man it was such a kick in the gut to hear that uh even at their earnings report bobby kodak going through and just saying like oh we just had record profits you know and it's like he doesn't give a shit he has these millions of dollars and you know what's also a big kick in the pants they had this new CFO that they hired in. I believe it was a CFO or whatever. And they yeah. gave him a $50 million bonus right then yeah. and there. You give your new CFO a $15 million bonus, and yet you lay off 800 different employees. 
what kind of message are you sending to your workers that are working at your company? You're saying that unless you're making the higher echelon, unless you're an executive inside their chair, or unless you're Bobby Kotick or the CFO or whatever the hell, if you're in a higher spot, that's what matters to them. Not the actual workers that go forth and put forth the effort and this and the that. The same can be said of a lot of different companies in general, which, hey, I highly understand that. But what I'm failing to understand is this whole core of ethics stuff is just thrown immediately out the window because of corporate greed. I don't understand like how people can just be gambled, like their lives can be gambled just like that. Because they know for a fact that they let go about 800 some different people. They can go ahead and hire on 800 different more people or something like that. At different aspects of different types of like backgrounds or experience stuff. In case they got to go forth and make the next big thing. But no matter, no matter the situation in terms of like how this would have happened and stuff. It's just terrible all the way around. I mean... I feel sad for a bunch of the people that got laid off and stuff, and I hope they do find jobs fairly quickly. I know a lot of other developers inside the industry have reached out, like, just saying, just like, hey, we're hiring here. You know, just, like, go forth and just follow things, just follow the link that we provided, this and that. I've seen a lot of that going on on Twitter, you know, various gaming publishers, various gaming, like, uh, development studios, you know, hiring extra help. You know, just try to give these people an option, though, because it's just, yeah, it's just like, um, it may not immediately help everybody, but at least it's something to comfort the blow or something. I mean, hell, that's just tragic in and of itself. But, uh, yeah, honestly, all I can just wish for at this point is just that the people who are laid off, they find their next source of income fairly soon and that they prosper and have, like, successful amount of, like, career for what they find you know <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I agree yeah it's yeah it's it's a shitty situation i and i hope they all land on their feet and uh you know they find something soon um but uh yeah no good way to transition out of that um but we're gonna we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it um so uh once again this week i i've only played like five minutes of games <laughs> um or like 30 minutes i played like another half an hour of resident evil 2 uh, just crazy going on. Uh, no life. shame you know, in that, like, man. It's everyday yeah. life. There will be times yeah. when we don't even play hardly anything, like maybe a half an hour to an hour. It's just now things roll. <laughs> yeah. So just been uh, work's been crazy. Uh, we're doing like a bunch of remodeling at the place, uh, the house right now. Ah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So a lot, just a lot going on. Um, but um, Gables, you you mentioned earlier. You've been playing some games, so why don't you uh, tell us about them? All right, so after the Nintendo Direct initially ended, there were a bunch of different things that became available. Obviously, the big the big things that came out of there that were available right after the Direct was the Yoshi's Crafted World demo, the Damon X Machina Prototype Missions demo, and the initial Tetris 99 game. Free to play, no other types of costs and stuff. You just go through, and the only... It was free based upon how you having your Nintendo Switch online subscription, which mm. that is something I didn't even know of right at the bat because I'm kind of glad that I paid for a year recently because uh, I would have had to pay that $20 just to play this free-to-play game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So to start things off, I played through Yoshi's Crafted World. Initially, there's like a few levels inside this demo so there really isn't too much like in terms of delving into but what i did wet my feet in was a lot of the different was actually just like a couple of uh different spots inside the first overall world i did feel very familiar with the controls because it's a yoshi game through and through you know how yoshi works he mm -hmm. goes through he throws eggs he does his little flutter jump does this and that and stuff what I found cool inside of this demo was the creative ways that you could use his eggs and stuff to throw things in a foreground or background of different stages. Here's the thing. You sometimes have enemies or coins that are like right in the background and you think to yourself, oh, okay, this is like a 2D perspective. How can I reach that? Well, you actually can throw your eggs inside either the foreground or the background based upon if you can target them or not. 
So there were situations where I got Yoshi coins, I got these various collectibles just by experimenting with uh, the you know the shy guys that I consumed or the egg boxes that I got, like random eggs and stuff. And I gotta admit, it was very creative. Inside of these type of games, I try to do, I try to collect every little collectible inside of a stage because, in my honest opinion, that's how I get the most out of, like, say, a level. Like, it's outside of, like, say, inside of, like, a platforming game like Yoshi, like Mario, like Kirby. It just gives me a, a sense of, oh, hey, this is, this is pretty creative how they hidden all these various little collectibles and stuff. So there are specific instances I can remember from this one level where... You have a group of three shy guys. Each of them are individually colored. Like, two of them are red, one of them is yellow. And the one in the middle has this coin that's like... All three of them have coins, right? But the center one had the red coins that you collect. Like inside, say, Yoshi's Island, you have to collect at least 20 red coins inside of here. So, the basic collectibles are more or less akin to, say, Yoshi's Island, personally. From what how I've thought. What I've loved is just, like, the aesthetic look of the game itself. Because a lot of the paper, paper mache type of aspects and stuff, it's fairly interesting to see the the concept, the concepts of the level evolve while you're progressing through it. Because when I was going through the stage, I came across this train. You know, this train that kept on riding through the stage and everything. It's not until eventually, once you get to the later part of the stage, where you actually get to ride the train. But before you can do that, you have to get these different parts of this train because you have Kamek and Bowser Jr. that have stolen parts from the train and you have to go through this initial small town inside of this level in order to try to find the individual parts. And it's kind of a cutesy sort of thing where all the little individual buildings are all paper crafted, all like kind of crayon colored and this and that and stuff. But it also uses elements of foreground background stuff as well to where you could check all over in terms of uh, what's initially on the ground and stuff but you'll come across things in the background say like hidden little question blocks like you would in Yoshi's Island and this and that and stuff like that but I left I left this level feeling like there was a lot of potential in terms of how creative some environments were going to get because I enjoyed myself playing through the crafted world demo I mean absolutely I did the little downs or something like that was kind of it of itself. It being a Yoshi game is kind of like a double-edged sword in a way. Because as I enjoy like the familiarity of the Yoshi games, it's kind of like, okay, what else is new in regards to some of the gameplay stuff? Now, I've already mentioned the aesthetics of like how certain stages like evolve based upon manipulating some of the paper crafted stuff in the foregrounds and the backgrounds. But there are also like other types of like collectibles... You know, that you have to go through and manipulate as well. And I'm kind of wondering if, like, if it's going to be kind of like an oversaturation of what you're going to collect inside this game. Now, when I think of collectathons inside of a platformer that overdid it, I think Donkey Kong 64. The reason why I bring up Donkey Kong 64 is it's the extreme when it comes to collectathons. You had five Kongs. You had five different bananas you had to collect. You had five different banana type coins you had to collect in each world. Now, the reason why I bring it up is because Yoshi's Crafted World, it kind of kind of let me with a feeling of, okay, I gotta manage like three to five different types of collectibles. Now, it's not as extreme as in Donkey Kong 64, but I kind of felt in terms of collectathon collectathon things, I kind of felt uh, it's kind of a little bit overdoing it in terms of things, in terms of like just go through and just collect a whole bunch of stuff. It's just a personal thing that I feel. Because I come off of playing little bits of New Super Mario, New Super Mario Brothers Deluxe, you know, Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe. <laughs> and the only thing I really had to collect was those little star coins in the other stage. And it's like, if you kind of evolve past, like, collecting one type of, like, or one or two different types of, like, uh, things in order to complete the stage, you know, it just kind of gets sort of complicated and it gets kind of, like, uh, padded in a way to where it just kind of feels like, oh, okay, this is kind of dragging on a bit. Whereas in New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, I kind of feel like that it's appropriate because the stages are, 
the stages are designed basically to just uh, not only be enjoyable, but also because they do a great job in terms of like hiding the little bits of the collectibles based upon like how the game is designed. So I'm kind of fascinated to see once I do pick up Yoshi's Crafted World, which I will, I will once it releases in March. I'm kind of wondering how how much more creative the worlds are going to be, if the collectibles are going to be overrun, which that's kind of like my fear on this type of game. But otherwise, the gameplay is very solid. And I liked what I played, and I'll definitely have more about it once I do pick it up next month. So moving on, I played another demo, which was the Damon X Machina prototype missions. Hmm. I went inside this demo not fairly being interested because... The overall concept of this game kind of reminds me of sort of like a generic anime to where it's like, okay, these mechs go through, do these various missions, and do this and do that, and stuff like that. It also doesn't help the fact that the story kind of feels sort of generic in its way it's presented and stuff. And some of the character designs and stuff when you're creating your own character are pretty basic. Kind of basic to the point where it kind of made me feel like I was going through and uh, creating characters for, like, say, Fantasy Star Online again. <laughs> Which, honestly, isn't a bad thing, but uh, here's the thing. When you have a creative character, I love it to be kind of, like, robust in terms of me editing, like, my hairstyle, this and the, that and stuff. Instead of just being preset with all these crazy-ass hairdos and stuff like that, like an anime protagonist. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, though. It's just my personal <laughs> preference. I love my character to be bald. Because <laughs> I'm bald in real life. It's like, okay. has got a type. <laughs> Pretty much. But anyway. <laughs> what I left... When I left playing these Damon X Machina, like, uh, missions, these prototype missions, I was left fairly, actually, intrigued by this game. And it was more so how easy it felt for me to actually gain the concept of the controls of it. So quintessentially, you could use like the D-pad to switch between certain weapons. You could use like the B button to try to elevate, you know, just like to rise up your robot and do this and do that and stuff. And what I really loved about it, the gameplay kind of felt smooth to me. I mean, obviously there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve for people coming into this game. But I love the aspect that I can actually manipulate the mech by buying different types of equipment and just the just like setting up different type of play styles with this thing, it kind of got me kind of interested because of how complex the actual concept of building your own mech and doing all these different types of modules, like manipulating different types of like uh, how fast the thing can get or how like uh, how many different types of weapons you can do. You can actually make a set where you can have like double shields and stuff and just be like uh, <laughs> be super defensive and this and of that. In a way, it kind of reminded me sort of, sort of, in a way, like Custom Robo, how that was, in terms of how you could build a character, build, like, certain sets based upon, like, different types of weapons and armor you got. But, unlike Custom Robo, the action inside this game felt a lot more intuitive, a lot more organic, in a way. Because the basic structure of this mission is you're going through, you're taking out these random enemies... At some points, I kind of felt like I was playing Star Fox without the on-rails portion. Because I was targeting on to specific robots and stuff like that. These little drones and stuff. I was shooting them out of the air. I was just... Honestly, I was having a good time with it. Because it's like I was shooting robots out of the air. And all of a sudden, it goes to a cutscene where all these big old mechs just come, like, uh, crashing through the stage and stuff like that. And it's like you have to try to hold out and stuff. And I gotta admit, trying to do these random attacks, evading, like, different types of firepower and stuff. And then just... Uh, Finding the different type of crates to do like recovery health and of that. It's like I did have a decent time playing it. And honestly, I'm fascinated to see how much more is it to this game. Because from that one little area where I had a bunch of different missions I had to go through, there was a fairly length there was like a fairly large amount of a field that I can actually go through, hide behind things and do this and do that. There's a lot of different cover and stuff and I'm actually more excited now leaving the Damon X Machina demo that I initially had coming in. Because, honestly, I had almost next to no expectations coming in. I thought I was going to be complicated. I thought I was going, not complicated, but I thought I was going to be confused from the get-go. Which, I kind of was in an aspect up until I got my hands on the game itself. 
and I started just fiddling around with weapons and fiddling around with certain things. Oh, okay, it's this type of a game. <laughs> then I just started having a little bit more fun with it. Now, this leads me to the last game that was released by the Nintendo Direct, that stealth announcement for whole Tetris 99. Oh boy, Tetris 99. I'll tell you what, man, this is definitely a smash hit that came out of nowhere. Kind of similar to what Apex Legends is currently doing on other consoles. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> all of a sudden, my freaking upper respiratory decided, oh, okay, let's go ahead and burp all simultaneously. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. The gameplay of Tetris 99 is going to be familiar from the get-go. It's just Tetris, right? But yeah. you have that type of that mystique where you're playing against 99 other different players at the same time, which I've come across issues where I've had, had been disconnected. I could not find certain people, but that wasn't a lot. Honestly, from the most part, I've been able to go into games, find the people recommended, you know, find the people that are in this. And I absolutely have been having a blast, honestly, because everyone else is in the background. And I don't know, like, and I don't have that type of pressure front and center to where I'm like, okay, this dude next to me is like stacking up a whole bunch of blocks and stuff. I better be quick about it and do this and do that. Oh my gosh. It has actually felt quite enlightening because here's the thing about me. I'm a huge Tetris fan. I have been ever since I was a kid, you know, ever since that was my one of my only games I could play on the Game Boy because my little brother kept hogging every fucking game that I had. Well, that's the thing about autism and stuff like that. You can't really go through and tell an autistic kid, like, oh, okay, you can't play this or can't play that. No. No, yeah. you can't. Seriously. I tried that as a kid. No, big mistake. <laughs> but uh, anyway, going back to Tetris 99, the game is an absolute blast to play. Just the feeling that you're playing against a bunch of different people and just the fact that you can go through and just like, it's going to be totally random, the type of people you're going to play against, obviously. You could have somebody that could be potentially so good and stuff that you get knocked out first thing, or you could actually go through and you could last for a hell of a long time. The first time I played Tetris 99, I got all the way up to about 63, 64, or something like that out of 99 people. Second attempt, you know, was like a little bit lower or something like that, but then again, the last, the third attempt, and this is like the first 10 minutes I played this game, right? I got to number 25. <laughs> <laughs> but uh overall i think i've really played like about a half an hour of this game but the time that i've played has felt super fun and super engaging where it feels like i've played this game longer than i have <laughs> so at this moment of recording the highest i've actually managed to achieve is number 20 <laughs> nice. so i'm working my way up i have not gotten into that top 10 echelon but oh my god it feels super satisfying to play so high among other people in terms of like like say go through and just like play a game and like oh hey i beat like about how many more people here i beat about like 60 or 70 people here yeah this feels nice this actually feels kind of good and that's when then and of itself i realized the appeal of the battle royale style games because <laughs> it's like even if you don't win these type of games, you feel super good about yourself because you've actually managed to finish higher than certain other people, you know? And that's the kind of the draw and appeal I can understand from playing Tetris 99 because I got a better understanding of the Battle Royale genre in and of itself from maybe not in the first person, like, shooter perspective, like, say, how people have been playing PUBG, Fortnite, now Apex Legends, and, like, the Call of Duty 4, like, black Blackout stuff. Mm -hmm. But I got a good estimate, a good generalization for this one playing Tetris 99. And oh my gosh, because it's Tetris and I haven't played for so long, I thought initially I was going to suck about I was going to like suck in terms of the gameplay stuff. But honestly, I have not even got into my form yet and I'm already getting upwards to like the top 20s. <laughs> nice. Oh man, but man, Tyler, I would highly recommend you trying the game out. It is fun. Oh. It's a fucking blast, dude. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I, I definitely want. I'm gonna check it out here, especially with it being free. Um, 
That does sound like, I mean, everybody's loving it. I'm not a big Tetris guy. or I'm not, not that I'm not a Tetris guy. I'm just not very good at it. I just never really dove into it. So I do want to try that out. And um, I, I think, I don't know, since that demo's out for that Demon X Machina, maybe I'll just give that a shot too. Because, yeah. uh, I don't know, maybe I will like it. I don't know. It's just kind of the impressions I've seen, just kind of watch it, have not done anything for me. But, Man, uh, yeah. It's at least worthy of a try. You know, it's free to play. There's really no loss in and of itself you know, to actually try out the Tetris 99 game. And I highly recommend people who have a Nintendo Switch, go ahead, try this game. Try out all the demos I mentioned, because who knows, maybe one of them is going to strike your fancy. Because, I'll be perfectly honest, all the demos that I played that released out of Nintendo Direct, I've actually had a lot of fun and enjoyed a lot of it. Especially with uh, the whole Yoshi's Crafted World, the Damon X Machina Pro Missions, and it's like, oh boy... The whole full-on game of Tetris 99, man, that was just something that I was just head blown aback by, man. That was just such a good experience playing through. But uh, that's pretty much what I've been playing in terms of this week. It's a little bit short. It has, it definitely had like, uh, I definitely had elements where I tried playing New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe and stuff, but it's just kind of the thing where I just don't feel like in the mood to play specific things. You know, as a matter of fact. If I want to go on record saying this right now, it's like, here's the thing about me as a gamer. I go through and I play based upon what I feel like at the moment, combined with something that I have a craving to do. Last year was an excellent example. When one of my friends tried to like get me to play Pokemon with her and stuff like that, and she wanted to go through and have me play like through alongside her... All the different Pokemon games from beginning of the first generation to the newest current stuff... I didn't back down from that challenge. I actually preserved and played through, even when she didn't. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, and why I bring up detention that is because I've been starting to get cravings of a different sort of like playing games here. I'm actually felt like I want to try to play through and complete more games. Now, what that's going to akin to, I'm not sure, but after the recent PlayStation Flash sale, and I'm seeing all these different games that I've had somewhat some interest in just drop in price up until, like, oh, uh, well, this sale is good, like, from the February 12th all the way to the 18th, so it's a time of recording, it could be over, but what I'm saying is seeing games like Assassin's Creed 2 and seeing games like, say, all these other games that I had played and played them in the past, man, it's like, it just gives me that sort of inkling to where I want to find that game to where I want to just complete it. I just feel like I just want to complete things, you know, just like get things out of the way. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know what, in a nutshell and stuff, that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> okay. Well, very cool, man. Thank you for carrying that portion of the show for me. Yeah, um, no biggie. Hopefully, uh, this week I'll have some time it's looking like things might be a little, a little, a little, a little less crazy at work. So maybe nice. uh, I can have a little more free time to be do, do some gaming. Um, but I think that's going to wrap up the show this week, guys. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for listening. If you do like the show, check us out on all of our social media places like Facebook, uh, Drunk Dashers Podcast. Like and join us. We have, a, we, have a face, we have a page and a group on there. So like and join us, please. On Twitter, at Drunk Pod. Follow us there. On Twitch, uh, at Drunk Nerds. Actually, you know what? Screw that. I go to Twitch slash Colonel Gables. Give them a big follow, please. And oh, then, of course. Yeah. Also, on uh, YouTube, Drunk Dash Nerds, subscribe, please. Give us a big thumbs up. Leave us a comment. Um, same thing with um, uh, iTunes. Please do that. Subscribe to us. Leave us a comment. Five stars there. And then also, we're on Spotify. I don't know what you do on Spotify. I don't know if there's like a review thing you can do. Uh, but there is like a thumbs up or a follow or something like that. Actually, you can follow us. Uh, do that, please. But if there's any review things you can do, really appreciate if you did that for us. Um, but other than that, uh, I have been your host this week. I was Tyler. And I have been Colonel Gables. So until next time, everyone, I hope you have yourself a good week. I hope you play a lot of fun games. And most importantly of all, I'd love to thank every one of you for listening to another fun-filled episode of the Drunk Dash Nerds podcast. Hey, Gables. Yep. Too sweet. Too sweet, man. <laughs> Bye, guys. See ya. <laughs>